today um, I want to tell you a little bit about, uh, uh, as, a, as the title says, quantum entanglement and entropy in non-commutative spaces. But uh, <clears throat> I'd like to start off with a very simple example, which is irreducible entropy from this <clears throat> from three spin halves. So I'll show you uh, this example and how this entropy comes about for the system of three spin half particles. And uh, then situate this discussion in a more abstract setting, that of uh, algebra states and the ensuing entropy that, uh, that this discussion naturally leads to. Uh, this will then uh, allow me to uh, discuss, this, uh, su subsequent to that, I'm going to uh, uh, remind you about the kinds of non commutative spaces that we have seen here in the Sagna's fuzzy sphere, the Moyal plane, the uh, Kappa Minkowski space that uh, was prominently mentioned today, and uh, argue that uh, uh, in constructing these spaces, it's very natural that these manifolds, uh, in the non commutative ones, as well as the ones that you get in the, con in the commutative limit, uh, natu naturally acquire entropy. And I'll end with some. Uh, some remarks, hopefully sufficiently provocative. Okay, so I want to start off by describing a system of three spin half particles, and let's say that we have these three, three spin half particles. And uh, to make the discussion, uh, to to remove uh, some unnecessary complications, let's say that these particles are not charged, but they are identical. So the particles that I have in mind are, say, neutrons, and they are all sitting at a point. Now, the algebra of observables for this system uh, is, uh, because I am going to concentrate only on the spins, the algebra of observables are the spins Si for each of these, uh, each of, each of these neutrons. And then, uh, in order to make it into an algebra, I have to take their products and, and linear combinations thereof. Okay? So now, we know from, uh, uh, from our uh, undergraduate quantum mechanics, and maybe some of us know from even earlier, that if you take three spin half particles, then you can decompose a tensor product of three uh, spin half representations into a spin three half and two copies of spin half, right? So the full Hilbert space, which is eight dimensional, uh, breaks up. Uh, Okay, the full Hilbert space is eight-dimensional, and uh, if you start off with this with the with this state in which uh, uh, the total spin in the say in the z direction is three halves, then we can construct the spin half representation quite easily by repeated repeatedly applying j minus. Right? Now this four-dimensional uh, subspace of the original uh, Hilbert space is in some say is in fact a unique four-dimensional subspace. And the projector to this subspace is uniquely defined because this projector has, is essentially what this projector does is, is projects to, the, to those states which have j squared given by 3 half into 3 half plus 1. And uh, if you would like, if you have some, uh, some, some atom or something or some molecule which has this spin 3 half then if, and you want to discuss its uh, quantum dynamics it's a uh, simple matter to construct its density matrix it's like how I like, like this is normally what we do and uh, <coughs> if, if we do construct a density matrix then it's <coughs> straightforward to compute the von Neumann entropy corresponding to this density matrix it's simply trace row log row or equivalently sum over lambda uh, uh, sum over all the lamb sum over m of minus lambda m log lambda m. Now uh, this uh, particular four dimensional subspace is not of interest to me so I, wrote, I won't have anything to say about it and I'm going to ignore it henceforth. It's the complement the, the other four dimensional subspace that I'm interested in. The complement, which is four-dimensional, represents two copies of the spin-half representation. And, uh, for example, if you look at uh, the spin with SZ equal to plus half, then there are two states, right? And I've written them out for you. This, uh, this you can work out yourself or uh, just 
believe me, there's, there's nothing subtle about it. It's something that we often give as homework. So there are two states with j equal to m equal to half, which are represented as, which are labeled as u1 and u2, and they are written in terms of linear combinations of the uh, spin states of the original three spin half uh, uh, wave functions. But we notice that because there are two of them, I can mix these two by an arbitrary SU2 matrix to get two other states with the same quantum numbers, j equal to half, m equal to half. So I can get a, 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 a V uh, by just rotating the U's with an SU2. And uh, this, these V's will again continue to have sz equal to plus half and s squared equal to half into half plus one. So in other words, the u's and the v's will have exactly the same expectation values or same observables will see no difference between the u's and the v's. In other words, there is an SU2 worth of ways of decomposing this four dimensional subspace into two spin half subspaces. There is no observable that distinguishes between the U's and the V's. So in other words, this SU2 action that I just showed you is a redundancy exactly in the same sense of being a gauge symmetry. If you remember, a gauge symmetry is a symmetry that commutes with all observables of the theory, not just the Hamiltonian or any particular observable, but it's a symmetry that commutes with all observables of the theory. And here is an example, a very simple example of an emergent SU2 gauge symmetry in a, in a very simple system that we know from more or less our first course in quantum mechanics. Now, by you, the real question that I want to go to is how do I define density matrix matrices in this four dimensional subspace? It's not at all obvious because there's no canonical projector to either of the spin half subspaces. And by canonical, what I mean is a projector that I construct out of the <coughs> linear combinations of observables. For example, when we do the stern galak experiment, the projector to the state spin up or the projector to the spin, spin, state spin down is a sigma z plus half, I mean one plus or minus sigma z, right? So this is a projector that I'm constructing out of the observables of the theory. Here, there is no projector that I can construct out of the observables of the theory, which will project either one of, this, one of the subspaces or the other. Now by hand, of course, I could construct this projector, which is uh, <coughs> taking the linear combination, uh, taking this ket bra sum over all m's, of the states that I defined as a use. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, I could try to write out the, the density matrices starting with this projector. So I, I could split this Hilbert space, this four dimensional Hilbert space into two copies and then write down uh, density matrices in each of the copies, row one and a row two. But because of this gauge, uh, gauge symmetry or gauge re redundancy that I showed you, there's an SU2 worth of projectors uh, which are which actually come with this label U, uh, the U being uh, the matrix that I had written, uh, U being this SU2 matrix. So there's an SU2 worth of projectors, if you like. And uh, any density matrix for, uh, for any U will give me the same expectation value for any observable A. In other words, the expectation values themselves will be independent of u. And this is how it should be. This is not surprising. However, <coughs> the von Neumann entropy, the one that, I, that we defined earlier as minus trace rho log rho, now depends on this u. This should have been a capital U. This depends on this SU2 matrix u. And this entropy, uh, as I will argue later on, is always non-zero. So the quantum state that we will or equivalently the density matrix that we will construct is necessarily impure. So uh, let's say that we, I did define a density matrix like this, uh, rho as lambda 1, rho 1 plus lambda 2, rho 2 with lambda 1 and lambda 2 being positive numbers and adding up to 1. 
This, uh, this density matrix comes from using uh, the non-canonical non projector that I showed you earlier. You know? If I had chosen a different projector PU, then <coughs> with, with a very, very small amount of algebra, it's easy to see that these lambdas now change, like I've shown here, the lambdas change by being multiplied by the modulus of the, this should again have been a capital U, a U squared, the, the modulus of the SU2 matrix squared. So the lambdas change, and the von Neumann entropy, S is equal to minus sum over A lambda A log lambda A, now depends on U. Now this is a, a, a rather surprising, con but inevitable conclusion, you see, that uh, all observables in the, uh, you, might, you might, you could consider any observable you like in, in this discussion. It wouldn't be able to tell you the difference between somebody who is using a basis and another person who is using, Bob who is using one basis and Alice who is using a U-rotated basis. They would, Bob and Alice would agree completely with each other as far as expectation values of any observable in this system is concerned. Except, Bob and Alice would not agree on the entropy associated with the state. Now, of course, this would lead. This leads to a discussion which we should, if we want to have, should uh, discuss towards the end of the talk is as to whether entropy is an observable. But uh, you can see that uh, that uh, for the moment, I do not want to have to say anything more about this. But in any case, we are all agreed that entropy is uh, whether observable or not. Entropy is definitely very important in a large class of discussions that, that we have nowadays. Okay. So uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this was a short example which I hoped, uh, which I uh, made, which I showed you from uh, undergraduate quantum mechanics to show you that von Neumann entropy is actually uh, gauge dependent, if you like. Now I want to show it to you that this situation is more generic than one imagines. So I'd like to remind you about the algebraic approach to quantum field theory. Something that yes, give credits to credits like in a good movie are in the end. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, students are my students and your students. I mean, um, Andre's students. And Andre's students, but uh, Andre's will. When Andres speaks, he will report that and he will give credit to his students. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so I just want to briefly remind you, uh, this is a reminder because uh, the, uh, large, um, uh, the large number of the sections of, large sections of this audience is, uh, uh, is an expert in the algebraic approach. So, um, uh, this is, uh, uh, I just want to uh, to remind you about uh, uh, about those parts about algebraic uh, uh, the, uh, about those parts of this approach that is relevant to the discussion here. So the basic idea is that you start off with an algebra of observables A, and this uh, in its most general setting is a C star algebra. In its uh, in its very simple setting which I showed you, this, it's just the uh, it's it's just the spins and uh, the algebra generated by these spins. Okay. States are positive linear functionals on A, so if you like, in some sense, they are dual to the algebra A. And uh, <coughs> these states are, uh, form a convex set, and the associate, the entropy, you can compute an entropy corresponding to any state, and this entropy is unique if, if uh, I think this is if and only if, this convex set is a simplex. Now the GNS construct, construction, the G and N and S standing for Gelfand, Neumark, Siegel construction gives us a canonical Hilbert space associated with this state omega. If you change the state, then this uh, the GNS Hilbert space in general changes and so on and so forth. So this Hilbert space is a canonical Hilbert space, but it's canonical in the sense, uh, but it is, but one must remember that it is uh, it, it, I require to construct it. I require uh, to give you this uh, state omega. 
And this Hilbert space carries a representation phi of this algebra of observables. Now, in general, this algebra of this representation phi could be reducible. Okay? Uh, there are um, um, uh, there are very restricted conditions under which this representation is actually reducible. Generically, it's reducible. So we could ask to that this representation be broken up into its irreducible bits. So let's say that um, uh, I'm uh, representing the different I'm labeling the different irreducible representations by the index j, and if a particular irreducible representation occurs more than once, then I'm using the label R to label different uh, copies of the same irreducible representation. So R may be greater than one for some of the chains. And the example in the example of the three spins, the spin half representation occurred more than once. So then for J corresponding to spin half, R would be two in that example. Now, <clears throat> this uh, when the degeneracy of representations, uh, when this when R is greater than one, we in general don't get a simplex, and this is a situation where you run into difficulty, you run into uh, an interesting tension between uh, this statement, this statement, corresponding associated entropy is unique. And this is a place where uh, interesting things happen when we, the, the uh, when we don't get a simplex. Okay. <clears throat> so this is sort of the general setting, and um, I gave you the, now you can go back and see that the, the, these general remarks that I made uh, translate back to the example of three spins, and you can see uh, where this origin of entropy comes, where this where it, it is the origin of the same entropy that I showed you. Now uh, in uh, in our study of non-commutative spaces, the algebra of functions, uh, if it is a commutative space, it allows us via the gelfand neumann theorem to reconstruct the topological space. So for example, the classical phase space, which uh, we study as, uh, uh, as made up of, as being uh, coordinatized by the p's and the q's, is nothing but the commutative algebra of observables. Observables by classical observables, I mean functions of p's and q's. So commutative algebra gives us a classical space, and in some sense, you might take this as the as a definition of what one means by quantum, which is that in this sense, non-commutative algebras are fundamentally quantum algebras because commutative algebras always gives us a classical space. So the kinds of non-commutative spaces that uh, we are familiar with and as examples that we are familiar with are the fuzzy sphere, the Moyal plane, the Kappa-Minkowski which uh, was discussed uh, earlier today in the morning and <clears throat> these if you like are uh, these in, in all these examples what I have given you is some, some kinds of relation say in this case commutation relation that uh, some uh, special operators in this space satisfy and the space is generated by uh, looking at the enveloping algebra if you like of uh, uh, that is generated by these x's and in order to construct the space time of course we need to be given not just this algebra but also the state just like in just like in what i showed you earlier but uh, for many states, we will produce spaces that will carry a non-trivial entropy, exactly like the case of the spin half, uh, the three spin halves. So, sorry, quick question. Yes. Multi positions. What about momentums? Momentums are not. Uh, you may wish to consider spaces which have more complicated relations. These are only examples that I have given. Examples of non-commutative spaces. There may be spaces that you may wish to consider, and it is, it, it, it's not going to take away from the main point that I want to make, which is that in order to reconstruct the space time, it's not enough for me to give you just, the, just this, but also the state, <coughs> also a state on which uh, this algebra, which is from which I will construct the Hilbert space. 
so you may wish to consider other uh, other these are there are i don't know zillions and zillions of non commutative spaces i have written down three of them i think he's suggesting the heisenberg algebra sorry i think he's suggesting the heisenberg algebra of ordinary quantum mechanics yes there are two even in the heisenberg if you you i i should have started off by uh, or maybe the fourth one should have been the example of a non commutative phase space which is commuted at xp is equal to ih bar that is an example and even there it's not enough for me to give you just the algebra that is generated by the x and p's in order to do quantum mechanics i need to give you a state okay, sir does that answer your question yeah okay so i'm going to uh, restrict my attention to the fuzzy sphere for the rest of the talk but uh, there is no doubt that whatever i'm going to show you now without uh, uh, without much difficulty can be uh, the same you can play the same game in these other spaces as well so let me remind you about uh, the fuzzy sphere and a simple model for the fuzzy sphere is via the schwinger construction the schwinger the schwinger construct schwinger had a, had a very nice way to construct representations of the uh, irreducible representations of angular momentum and the same uh, discussion can be adapted to discuss the fuzzy sphere because you notice that <coughs> uh, that up to this overall scale lambda this is nothing if x is a hermitian then this is nothing but the angular momentum algebra okay so what we are going to do what schwinger told us to do is is to start off with a pair of oscillators a and uh, a1 and a2 so uh, such that the commutator of a and a dagger is 1 and a1 and a1 dagger is 1 and a1 and a2 commute then uh, uh, what we are going to do is construct this object x which is a dagger sigma a with the indices contracted uh, in the contracted like this this is give me going to give me a, an operator uh, is going to make, give me three operators x1 x2 and x3 because of the pauli matrix that is sitting here it's easy to see that the commutator of xi and xj is just i epsilon ij k xk and this is what it's not me this is schwinger and uh, xi xi is uh, can be written as n hat into n hat plus 1 where n hat is uh, the uh, total number operator a1 dagger a1 plus a2 dagger a2 okay. now <clears throat> because i'm going to use the harmonic oscillator i'm going to give you a brief uh, telegraphic uh, review remind you about the harmonic oscillator but in a little bit of with a little bit of more rigor thrown in than we normally do so the harmonic oscillator <coughs> is the hilbert space that i'm going to look, that we look at is spanned by an orthonormal basis labeled by a uh, positive uh, non negative integer n and then the standard bosonic annihilation operator a acts on this hilbert space like i've shown it annihilates the ground state the the, the state labeled by 0 and then any state labeled by n it lowers it to n minus 1 up to this factor of n to the half this operator a is an unbounded operator and uh, therefore cannot be defined its action cannot be defined on the full hilbert space it can only be defined on a dense domain of this hilbert space the domain here <coughs> is defined as follows which is the set of all vectors uh, uh, all linear combinations of the form cn times n such that sum over n of n times mod cn squared is finite this is the domain of a similarly you can you can define its adjoint it is adjoint what it does for you is to take the vector n uh, map it to n plus 1 up to this factor of n plus 1 to the half and uh, <coughs> its domain is the closure of the uh, closure of its domain is also the domain that i had written down earlier uh, the number operator which is a dagger a has a domain dn which is different from the domain of a and a dagger and it's the domain of the number operator is a set of all vectors in your hilbert space whose uh, which obey this condition that sum over n n squared times mod c n squared is finite so if you you can always have, it's very easy for you to find 
normalizable vectors uh, which uh, uh, on, uh, on which the number operator does not act properly. So, so the, the, the vect there are vectors in your Hilbert space which are normalized. Well, by the very fact that they are in your Hilbert space means that they are normalizable, but they don't, they don't obey this condition. So there are vectors in your Hilbert space for which the number operator is not well defined. Uh, okay. Now, <coughs> the ends, the bases that I wrote down that we are working with, <coughs> they are eigenstates of the number operator. And on the dn, it's on dn that these operators, a and a dagger, satisfy this competition relation. So if you like, something that we tell, uh, tell our students straight off the bat that the commutator of A and A dagger is 1 has to be has to come with this entire subtext about domains. If you are careless about telling, uh, if you are not careful about discussing these domains, you can very easily construct examples of situations where you violate this, violate this commutator. So this uh, algebra is, goes by various names, oscillator algebra for instance, and the number operator counts the number of quanta, A is uh, and a daggers destroy and create respectively one quantum. And by stone von Neumann theorem, this is a representation of the of the oscillator algebra, and it's unique up to unitary equivalence. So it's, it's uh, there's basically just one irreducible representation up to unitary equivalence of this algebra. What I'm interested in is. Uh, taking this Hilbert space and splitting it into two disjoint subspaces, those having even number of quanta and those having an odd number of quanta. So I'm going to split this Hilbert space into H plus, what I call H plus and H minus. On these subspaces, H plus and H minus, I can define operators B and B dagger, B plus minus and B plus minus dagger, whose action I've written here. So B plus, because it acts on H plus, <coughs> takes a state with e even number of quanta to n and reduces the number by 2. B, B plus dagger increases it by 2. So B plus and B plus dagger keep you inside H plus. Similarly, B minus and B minus dagger keep you inside H minus. B plus annihilates the vacuum that I had written earlier. B minus annihilates the state width one quantum in the, in the earlier in this way of labeling with n right? and b and b dagger are well defined in the domain <coughs> if you take the da in intersection h plus h minus and then close it then b and b dagger are well defined there so this <coughs> on these are rep representations of the other representations of the oscillator algebra that were constructed by Bryant and greenberg long time ago what they showed is that on this domain, dn intersection h plus or h minus, we have the commutation relation that b and b dagger com anti commutator is 1, just like a and a dagger is 1. Okay. So if you like, this pair b minus h minus, b plus h plus, and a h are three ways if you, of realizing this uh, oscillator algebra, three representations of the oscillator. But of course, by Stone von Neumann, they have to be equivalent to each other. So they are isomorphic to each other. They are one and the same. And in this paper of Brandt and Greenberg, they have this unitary operator which takes you from one to any one of these to the any other of these. So there exist these unitary operators, u plus minus, which will map the b's to the a's. Okay. But what we can do <coughs> Further, what Brandt and Greenberg went on to do is use that to construct reducible representations of the oscillator algebra. <laughs> so you take the projection operator, the projector to the h, projector to h plus, the projector to h minus, and define an operator b by using these projectors. It's <coughs> easy to see what b does on the on the basis vectors n. B will take an, um, a state with even number of quanta and take off two, uh, B uh, where, whereas it will take uh, an odd number of quanta and also take off two. Okay. 
Notice that both Z, the state 0 and the state 1 is annihilated by B. And with a little bit of work, you can check that the number operator, its commutator with B, gives you minus 2B. So in other words, something that we noticed earlier is that B changes the quantum number by two quanta at a time. You can define a new number operator, B dag of B, and can express it in terms of the original number operator and the projection. And uh, in, in terms of these Bs, the eigenstates, Ns are the eigenstates, but each eigenvalue is now two-fold degenerate. This B has the same domain of closure as the A that I had written now, as far as in the domain dn. And the pair BH forms a reducible representation of the oscillator algebra. So this is, uh, this is uh, although we are very familiar with oscillator algebras, we don't uh, very often see a discussion about the reducible representations. So I thought I would uh, show this to you because uh, A, because it is interesting, and B, because it was done a long time ago by Bryant and Greenberg. Now what we are going to do, so before I go on to, uh, to, to, to putting this in the context of the fuzzy sphere, I'm going to show you is that this this thing that I this this construction that I showed you in which I split the Hilbert space into just even and odd sub subspaces can be generalized to construct operators B K which uh, raises or lowers in this case lowers the state n by removing k quanta. So I I can do it in steps of k. So, for example, I can, uh, if I want to do it, I can do it, remove in steps of three. So then I'll have three irreducible, three distinct irreducible representations, which I can again combine together to form a big reducible representation. Okay. So, so in steps of prime sorry? So no, 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 no. There is no number theoretic, uh, there is no deep number theoretic issue here. You can go in any step, in the step of any integers. Sorry? You can make some periodic generators. You can make some periodic generators and uh, yeah. This is a, this is a, this is a buyer's market. So if you can find someone to buy it, go ahead. It's not necessary to so in 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 each of these uh, in each of these you will find that the Bs obey the standard commutation relations, and then you can construct a nice big reducible representation. So again, this uh, formula for decomposing the Hilbert space and Constructing this particular reducible representation, this discussion is there in um, uh, Greenberg's paper. So what we are going to do is I'm going to stake uh, in the Schwinger construction where, where I had two oscillators, A1 and A2. Instead of A1 and A2, I'm going to two use two oscillators, B1 and B2, where B1 is made up of K1 A oscillator, A1 oscillators. And B2 is made up of K2 A2 oscillators. So <clears throat> what this will give me is K1 times K2 identical copies of the fuzzy sphere algebra. So let me just remind you how we did, how we worked with the fuzzies, what we did with the, uh, uh, with the Schinger construction. So remember that uh, these X <coughs> was made by taking a dagger sigma a. So instead of a, I'm going to use b, where b is a, b corresponds to a reducible representation. And then the commutation relations xi, xj will still be i, xk, because the commutation relation of b and b dagger is still exactly the same as that of a and a dagger, except that b's are now made up of reducible representations of the oscillator algebra. If you follow it through, you find that um, it gives you k1 times k2 identical copies of the fuzzy sphere algebra, if you like, in 
the units that I've chosen of say the unit radius. If you put k1 equal to and k2 equal to 1, then you just get back what what is uh, what you just get back the usual one with irreducible representations of the uh, uh, oscillator algebra. And uh, now because you because there are so many identical copies of the fuzzy sphere algebra, <coughs> you can go ahead and compute the von Neumann entropy associated with this space. So there, there, there is it's exactly like how I showed you for the case of the fuzzy for the case of three spins, you will find that there is now a von Neumann entropy associated with this. And um, uh, the, the uh, size of the unitary matrix is no longer is no longer SU2. It's uh, oh, this should have been S. It's now a much bigger unitary group. It's of the size K U of K1 times K2. So this is a this is the entropy associated with the fuzzy sphere the, in this way of construction. Now the map that I showed you, in which uh, these lambdas become a function of u, this is a Markovian map. So if you look at how, when I change u. Uh, how the lambdas rearrange themselves is through a relationship like this. That lambda lambda of u is lambda times t, where t is just mod u squared. But because of these very nice properties of u, these being unitary matrices, they, they, they have this very nice property that if you take the modulus squared of any row or any column, you get 1. So each entry, each entry of this matrix constructed of mod squared of the, each entry of this matrix TAB is a positive number and each column adds up to 1 and each row adds up to 1. So this is nothing but uh, in, in ergodic theory or in theory of Markov processes, this is nothing but a doubly stochastic matrix or a bi-stochastic matrix. So if you like <coughs> this, um, the lamp, if you keep changing U, if you keep changing u, the lambdas change, but they change via a, a doubly stochastic Markov process. And uh, you can then go back and ask where this entropy, where, where this entropy is driven to. Turns out that this, this entropy is driven to its maximum value, which corresponds to all the lambdas being equal. And this maximum value is when log of, uh, it turns out to be log of k1 times k2. So uh, uh, the fuzzy sphere, <coughs> in this case, is an impure state, and it carries this irreducible entropy. There are no projectors which project to one of the of these irreducible representations only. There is no canonical projector, so there is no way we can purify the state unless we add into our theory operators that go beyond the fuzzy sphere algebra. Unless we add New, uh, new operators in our theory. Only then can we purify this and uh, uh, and reduce the theory, uh, reduce it to the state to a pure state. So I'd like to uh, summarize now. The von Neumann entropy is unambiguous in a situation is uh, is ambiguous in situations where we have an emergent non-abelian gauge symmetry, like I showed you. In classical manifolds, uh, uh, so if our classical manifolds are emergent from some underlying theory of quantum gravity, there would be states uh, of uh, some kinds of some non-commutative algebra. This is uh, there is no there is no proof for this, but I think that most people who, irrespective of your uh, favorite approach to quantum gravity, most people believe in this some version of this statement. And uh, generically, these non-trivial entropy would persist even at zero temperature. And uh, what we would like to understand is whether uh, the evolu this, uh, as this entropy changes, whether there is an impact on whether one can produce an impact on the evolution of geometric quantity, whether, uh, whether uh, the geometry would evolve. And this would re require us to understand uh, the thermodynamic aspects of this entropy. So I'd like to end here by saying that uh, this work on entropy ambiguity was done with, uh, with Baal here and Amilkar, not here. And my, 
The work on the entropy for fuzzy spaces was done with my two students, Nitin and uh, Nirbalindu. So, thank you very much.